Welcome to the Roadmap to Quality Teacher Preparation, an introduction to Branch Ed's signature framework hosted by Branch, Branch Alliance for Educator Diversity or Branch Ed. My name is Kim Igwe and I'm the Professional Development Associate here at Branch Ed. Thank you for joining us today. We are honored to have each of you here today. I know you're eager to hear from Dr. Patricia alvarez McCatton. We're gonna get started quickly after my three minute introduction. I'll briefly share the mission of Branchette with that. It's our vision to strengthen, grow, and lift up the impact of educator preparation programs at minority serving institutions as being central to efforts to shift the 20% of national representation of teachers of color to a much greater percentage of a diverse and highly qualified teaching force. In doing so, we can and will ensure America's children receive the best education and support as possible. Today is the first webinar in our 2022-2023 webinar series. The purpose of the 2022-2023 Nuts and Bolts series is to highlight the application of Branch Ed's signature framework for the quality preparation of educators which outlines a roadmap to create teacher preparation programs that meet the needs of our increasingly diverse student body. It seeks to build equity-oriented educator preparation programs that prepare educators to reflect, respect, and share the value of the diversity of America's PK through 12 school children. Today's webinar will present a general overview of our signature framework the research behind it, along with specific, specific indicators aligned to each principle. Following this webinar each month, we will dive deeper, deeper into a specific principle. You'll have an opportunity to hear from a wide range of teacher educators and their partners as they share how they have utilized each principle in their program improvement efforts. As a couple of housekeeping reminders, we are recording this webinar and it will be available on the Branch Ed resource portal along with many other resources. We are live streaming on our LinkedIn. We will use the chat for resources, links, or any tech issues that come up. Thank you to our Branch Ed team for your support and use the Q&A feature to ask any questions of the panelists. We'll have time at the end for Q&A. Before handing it over to Dr. Alvarez McCatton, let me briefly introduce her. She is our Senior Vice President of the Branch Alliance for Educator Diversity. In this role, Dr. Alvarez McCatton oversees all MSI EPP faculty and leader facing programming, including capacity building and professional learning initiatives. Working alongside the president and CEO, Dr. Alvarez McCanton helps to establish key organizational objectives, secure and ensure the best use of the organizational resources and raise awareness of the impact of minority serving institutions in the field of educator preparation. As an integral member of our senior management team, she cultivates and manages relationships with educator preparation programs and helps to position the organization to meet our needs. We are so excited to have you here today. So thank you so much, Kim. I really appreciate that. And hello, everyone. I'm thrilled to have an opportunity to have some conversation with you. Um, I do want to begin by saying that I know that you have a great deal of expertise in program development and in quality programs. So look forward to having you engage um, in sharing your knowledge um, and, I, and ideally exemplars of programs or practices that you're familiar with that exemplify the, the principles and indicators that we're going to talk about. So I'm gonna share my screen and uh, hopefully this will go off without a hitch. Um, so can you see my screen? We can see it, Patty. Perfect, wonderful. Well, I'll go right past this uh, introductory slide. I do wanna provide uh, a, a little bit of an overview of kind of what we're going to be talking about today. Um, I wanna share information about who we are and what we do. And it may be that some of you already know about Branch Ed, uh, but we're growing and, and there's all kinds of exciting things happening 
uh, with the organization. Um, we also want to talk about the impetus for developing this framework, the process of the development, and how you can apply the framework in your own work. Um, I'm also going to provide a high-level overview, as Kim has already shared, on each of the design principles and corresponding indicators. And each subsequent month, you will learn more about each of these um, particular principles. We are producing a brief for each one of the principles uh, that will be made available uh, when, when that webinar takes place, and we'll share that information as we go, we go through. Um, the exciting thing about the subsequent webinars is that we will have teacher educators and their P, uh, P12 partners and other stakeholders uh, as part of those uh, presentations. So you can hear from folks in the field exactly how they're living this, this work. And so the first thing that I wanna do is take a very quick poll. Susie's going to uh, share it out just to get an idea if you're familiar with Branch Ed or have ever attended a, a Branch Ed event. And if you can fill that out real quick, uh-oh, yes, that would be wonderful. Susie, you let me know when you're ready to, to provide uh, the results. Okay, Patty, I think we're good. Great, so uh, do the majority of the folks have uh, a knowledge of Branch Ed? Nine out of nine, 100%. Super, all right. Well, then that means that I can maybe, I think maybe go through some of this other information. But here's what I would say, if you have a, a, an understanding of Branch Ed, it may be a, a general holistic understanding of Branch Ed and not necessarily an understanding of the vision and the visionary, as I like to put it. And so, as you know, our vision is for all students to have access to diverse, highly effective educators. And uh, Branch Ed came to be uh, as a result of Dr. Cassandra Herring, uh, who is our CEO, uh, founder and president. And her passion for equity-driven education reform is firmly rooted in the belief that diversity and excellence are inextricably linked. She has more than 20 years experience in education. Her career spans all levels uh, of education. She's worked at early childhood all the way through higher ed and has led several education policy initiatives. She also served as the Dean of the School of Education and Human Development at Hampton for nearly 10 years. And I really wanna say that under her leadership, um, struggling education programs were transformed, uh, earning state approval, highest commendations by accrediting bodies. I could go on and on, but what I will say to you is that it has been an honor and a pleasure uh, to work under Dr. Herring. Um, she is an amazing leader and just, just a wonderful, wonderful human being. And so how did we come to be? So our history is rooted um, on, um, on the person who we were named for, and we were named for Mary Branch. She was the first woman of color to serve as president of an accredited senior college in the US. And she was remembered for high expectations, rigorous content, continuous faculty development, support, focus on the student and collaboration. Um, and so the legacy that we, we wanna leave a legacy, but we want to build on the legacies to empower, grow and sustain um, and advance EPPs. We know that minority serving institutions, as much as we don't particularly care for that term, as well as other institutions who prepare a disproportionate percentage of students of color, do the yeoman's work in diversifying the teacher workforce. And we also know that um, there, there's sometimes uh, the best kept secret in teacher preparation. So we wanna make sure to one, support their work and two, amplify their voice. Uh, and the reason we want to work with these institutions is because we know that, um, you know, over 40 years, um, they, they've, they've worked on um, doing what needs to be done in order to ensure that um, our, our teacher educators are diverse and our students have teachers that look and, and, and speak like them and, and uh, have um, similar cultures and so forth. So this is how we do it. The way we do it is we have four centers of excellence. Um, and I'm gonna kind of go um, kind of clockwise on here because as we go through uh, the individuals that we 
focus on with the center changes as well as kind of the intensity. So we begin with uh, the Branch Head Inclusive Rigorous Content Hub or BIRCH, which is who is hosting the Nuts and Bolts webinars. BIRCH focuses specifically on providing professional development and learning opportunities at the individual level. So we provide uh, virtual workshops, we have summits, and in fact, we have one coming up on uh, math learning, which um, we will share a little bit more about at the end of this webinar. Um, and we also do a summer institute. The next level would be our Innovation and Inquiry Center or our I-squared center. That center focuses on collaboratives. So what we mean by that is we, we um, convene what we call joint action groups or communities of practice who focus on a particular opportunity of practice, do a deep dive, develop resources um, and other materials that then teacher educators uh, and our PK-12 partners can utilize in, in their practice and in their uh, professional development opportunities. Our most intensive support is in the Transformation Center. The Transformation Center focuses on EPPs, so it is institutionally based. That is a three-year engagement um, in which we walk alongside these uh, educator preparation programs as they transform their programs, ensuring quality, sustainability, scale, and ultimately impact. And by impact, we mean ensuring that our PK-12 learners are, um, are thriving and are succeeding and are receiving the equitable education that they deserve. Uh, because we know that all the work that we do, if in the end, if it doesn't make a difference with our PK-12 learners, then that work was for naught. And then the last center is what we call the Educational Equity Accelerator. And that center focuses on the education sector. So um, it's, it's the more national kind of work. And it's also where our PK-12 work is housed. Um, so that kind of gives you an idea of how we do our work. And now we want to talk about the framework. And so why did we, um, why did we feel like we needed to develop a framework? for quality educator preparation. Um, and, and the reason is we really wanted to make sure uh, that we were supporting implementation of high quality preparation that focuses on equity, equity and diversity. And we wanted to expand that narrative of what constitutes quality in educator preparation. We wanted to center equity and diversity in, in discussions on educator preparation and program development. So, we, we believe that um, it is important to explicitly and inextricably embed diversity as part of the fabric of the entire teacher preparation enterprise. Um, and we wanna cultivate cultural awareness and competence in, in all teacher candidates. Uh, and we also know that much of the work around multicultural education has emerged from faculty and scholars and minority serving institutions thus a reason why we really wanted to work with these institutions. And so we want to take, a, 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 and we, I say here a poll, but it really is going to be a chat. So what I'd like for you to do is I would imagine all of you here are thinking, I already know some characteristics that high quality programs exemplify or that they need to demonstrate. And so what I would love for you to do is you can do it now, just pop in whatever comes to mind as far as those um, quality characteristics that are essential in ensuring equitable, diverse educator preparation programs that produce the caliber of teacher candidates and novice teachers that our students so, so greatly deserve. And we're gonna come back and revisit those as we go through it. So as we continue going through, feel free to continue populating that. So how did we develop this framework? And again, I think this is an important conversation for us to have and for you to know, because there was a lot of work and attention that went into designing and developing this, this uh, framework. So it was a multi-stage process. This actually began in 2016, and it took about two years in order to, to end up with a product that we felt was where we wanted it to be. And it began with a deep review of the existing literature on effective practices in teacher preparation. So that's where we started. From there, there were an array of one-to-one -one interviews with more than 50 faculty and leaders of educator preparation programs, representatives of advocacy organizations, teacher groups, 
and state program approval and department um, licensure department personnel in order to get more information from them and get their insight and their input um, to augment what the, the literature review uh, indicated. From there, we held a series of focus groups to obtain additional feedback and to help clarify and strengthen the framework and its component principles. And at that point, we convened a charrette, a charrette I hope I'm saying that right, charrette, um, and that consisted of prominent thought leaders in teacher education reform within and beyond MSIs uh, in order to leverage and garner specific feedback on its framework and the indicators. And the purpose of a charrette is to improve a piece of work. And so that was a really critical piece. From there, we went to Critical Friends Group to convene and share the draft. And then finally, we field tested it. And so it was field tested it, uh, by piloting, piloting the framework during site visits uh, that we conducted to eight institutions. Further refinements were made following the use of the instrument as a benchmarking tool um, from programs, and it was fully adopted in fall of 2018. Now, I want you to know that we have recently revisited the literature to, to ensure that the principles and indicators are still relevant. And the great news is they were. Um, as a result, we did make a few minor revisions to some of the principles, and we'll talk a little bit, not the principles, the indicators of the principles. We'll talk a little bit about that. So we enhanced it um, based on the, the, the most recent review of the literature. And so here's a question that I think it's, it's important to ask, and that is, well, is this framework more of the same? If we were to look at the literature base, we would see that there, there are a lot of frameworks out there that we can use as we think about our programming and design and, and revisions of, of educator programming. But here's what we want you to know. Um, our framework does not address teacher competencies. There are other frameworks that do that. We don't address philosophical orientations or ideological positions. What we do provide are concrete principles that are essential for design and implementation of high quality educator preparation programs. And within that, you can begin to see what are the expectations and skill sets that teacher educators need to possess in order to be able to do the work that they're charged with doing. Um, the application, how, how do we utilize this framework? Well, this framework guides our support with our EPPs. So for example, we do uh, critical friends visits uh, with institutions in which we apply the framework and we identify bright spots, um, um, areas for um, um, uh, improvement and recommendations surrounding uh, the framework principles and indicators. It also allows you, EPPs, to reflect on your own strengths and needs and areas of improvement. So you can take this um, framework and apply it to your program, to your practice, in order to get a sense of where your program is. It also guides our research agenda, and we believe that it serves as a national model for educator preparation. So what's in it? Um, and so um, you can see earlier that um, Kim shared this, um, this kind of graphic for you. And what I wanna point out in this graphic before we go into the specific indicators is that you'll see that there is a green kind of um, you know, circle that encompasses um, some of the indicators or some of the principles, and then there's a brown one. And, and that is very purposeful. The green outline indicates a community of learners. And that for us is first and foremost in the work that we do. We cannot do the work that we do in isolation. Um, we need others, one, to help kind of, you know, uh, sh share the mirror so that they, they can kind of point out to us some things that maybe we haven't noticed or haven't seen. There's expertise throughout um, the um, teacher preparation community and PK-12 community that can help us in doing the work that we do. It really is about all of us working together in order to ensure that our vision um, is enacted and, and is fulfilled. So we begin with the community learners because it really is about people. That's uh, one of our values as an organization is people first. And so um, that's the first one. The second one is around data empowerment. And again, that's really essential. We can't make decisions or make changes uh, or even you know, make improvements 
if we don't know what it is that is happening in our programs. It was really interesting. We were once having a conversation um, with, with a, uh, a colleague who was talking about, well, we need to do a curriculum mapping. And it's like, well, why? Well, because we do. And it's like, well, but what does the data say? And it was like, oh, yes, that's right. We need to look at the data to see where it is that we need to do improvements within our program. Um, and so data is a, is a really important um, component of what we're of our framework and what we do. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. And both of those serve as the foundation for the other four, which are intersectional content, practice-based approach, inclusive pedagogy, and I'll explain a little bit about that in a moment, and equitable experiences. So that this is the visual that kind of shares for you what this looks like and what the framework entails. So before we get started, here's what I, I want you to help us. And you've already helped us by starting to populate some of the characteristics and components that you feel are essential to a quality program. What we would like for you to do is, as I talk about the principles and the indicators, I would imagine that in your mind, a couple of things will happen. One, you will either say, oh gosh, we do that and we do it in this way. And that really is a great exemplar of that particular indicator or that particular principle. If that's the case, please use that hashtag Put it on Facebook, put it on LinkedIn, put it on Twitter, Instagram. We want to hear about these exemplary practices. The other thing that might happen is you might say, you know what, I, I know about this program in this institution where they're really doing some amazing work around this area. Share that information. What we're hoping is that our last webinar series, our last webinar of this series will really be you know, collating all of these exemplars of how folks have enacted and lived this framework and share that information with the broader community. And we'd love to highlight uh, your programs and other programs within the briefs on each of the individual um, principles that we're gonna share. So please don't forget that hashtag as we're, as we're talking through the rest of our time together. So again, the first one is about a community of learners. And I'm gonna tell you right now, I don't have the time to go into this really, really deep. So it's gonna be really high level. Um, and, you'll, and that's because we want you coming back. We want you to come back to our other webinars so you can really you know, get a, 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 the more in-depth information. But here we go. A community of learners is established when a group of people who seek to share values and beliefs actively engage in learning from one another. Um, the Educator Preparation Providers, EPPs, establishes a community of learners through leadership, shared responsibility for candidate learning, professional collaboration, growth mindset, collegiality, collectivism, organizational learning, and collective efficacy. And we actually added collective efficacy when we did this, uh, the most recent um, literature review. Collective efficacy was defined by Bandura as a group's shared belief in its conjoint capability to organize and execute the courses of action required to produce given levels of attainment. And so collective efficacy is a major contributor to organizational culture and has been found to strongly and positively impact student achievement. If we believe we can do it together, we can make it happen. And so we felt that that was an important additional indicator when we did this last review to add to our community of learners. The other piece as I'm talking through this is as we talk about this, this is focused on, on programs, right? And educator preparation programs and, and design level. But I also, when I think about this framework, I think about teacher candidates and how we as teacher educators should also consider building a community of learners within our teacher candidates. And as we talk about each of these um, uh, principles, you'll begin to see that the, it's almost like a parallel kind of um, journey, right? Where we as teacher educators, as, as PK-12 partners um, need to exhibit and, and live this um, framework, but there's also applicability uh, to the teacher candidates and then being able to exemplify these indicators in their practice as well. The second one is around data empowerment. And so data empowerment is defined as authority or power given to someone to do something. 
So data empowerment, therefore, is empowering individuals and the collective to access and engage your own data to improve your community. It is, it is not about compliance. It is about an active culture of inquiry. Yes, we know we have to comply. We know that there are things that we have to do, but if we stop there, we are shortchanging um, our students and their students. So we really want to really embrace this, this culture of inquiry. It utilizes authentic and ongoing cycles of evidence-based improvement that begins with asking thoughtful questions, moves through organizational learning and action, and ends with an evaluation of the effectiveness of action taken. I always say, you know, the, the, the data continuous improvement process has been successful if you end up with more questions at the end than you had when you started. Um, the indicators for data empowerment um, include data quality, because you, you know, we've all heard it. Uh, well, that data is wrong, or it, you know, it's no, that's not right. There's an issue. So we really want to make sure that we have focused on the quality of our data, data analysis and interpretation, because ultimately data really are either just numbers or words, and they come to life based on the interpretation that, that we do when we engage in an analysis of the data. Evaluation of instruction, formative assessment, quality assurances, and innovation and systemic change. Um, and and you know, data empowerment is really a never ending process. Um, but if you can get folks on board, it can truly be a, a transforming experience for all. And again, I will say to you, our teacher candidates must learn to be data empowered as well with their own data of their students and their progress. The next one has to do with uh, equitable experiences. And so equitable experiences means that we provide multi-layered holistic systems of candidate specific research-based supports, just-in-time interventions and enrichment experiences that are informed by data and identification of candidate specific needs. And I'm sorry if I keep scratching my nose, but I think I've got a little bit of an allergy thing going on. But what I would say here about um, equitable experiences is it's all about differentiation. If you have a one size fits all process or program or, or um, support you know, uh, uh, services, then you're not providing equitable experiences um, because we're all different. And so what we want to talk about is that these academic and social supports are provided and actively monitored to determine whether the activities are effective. So again, it goes back to making sure that we're data informed and that we're meeting our candidates' needs and enabling their achievement. And so this principle necessitates a shift from those isolated interventions to holistic supports that are based on an ethic of care recruitment and selection, advising, support structures, strong relationships, and induction support. It is about, as I said already, differentiation and not a one size fits all and, um, um, and about collaboration. So that is our equitable experiences principle. The next one is inclusive pedagogy. And what I wanna bring up here with inclusive pedagogy is that often when we hear the word inclusive or inclusion, we think about special education. Branch Ed defines inclusive pedagogy as instructional approaches that minimize or remove barriers to learning or assessments and supports the success of all learners while ensuring the academic standards are not diminished. I know that's a mouthful, but in essence, we really want you to understand this is not about inclusion from a special education definition, but it really is about inclusion broadly, broadly de defined and explained with regard to um, student success. It's about centering the learner. It's about adopting a learner stance, faculty and PK-12 partners, um, and paying careful attention to knowledge, skills, attitudes, beliefs, um, that learners bring to the educational uh, setting and recognize the importance of building on the conceptual and cultural knowledge, uh, the funds of knowledge in essence that we all bring with us. So indicators for this principle include uh, equity, um, 
sorry, include, you know what happens when you are working from home? Sometimes you've got little things that occur that kind of take your attention. So I'm gonna apologize for my brief digression and I'm gonna come back. Um, so clear expectations, equity literacy, indicators include clear expectation, equity literacy, which means you are equity conscious, take action to address inequities, instructional design, culturally sustaining pedagogy, effective engagement, and asset-based feedback. Again, this is a lot of information. And what I will say to you is we will send you this, uh, this recording. And also when you have the brief, all of this will be explained in, in, um, in more detail. And in fact, I am going to ask him to share with uh, our participants today our um, inclusive instruction brief that we've already developed, because I think it will help you to kind of get a sense how we're seeing this particular principle. Uh, the next item is practice-based approach. And basically, this is all about applied experiences, which help to bridge theory to practice. And so what's really important here is you all remember when we moved to this space about clinically rich practice um, and how important it was for, for our students, our candidates to spend time in the field. Well, what we know is that time alone is insufficient. The essence of those experiences, what happens in those practices are really essential um, to really spend a lot of time and, and spend attention. I, I, Hold on one second. I'm so sorry. And I'm going to apologize for having to step away for a moment. Um, so I'm going to uh, come back. Um, uh, so we're talking about practice-based approach uh, and the importance of ensuring that those experiences are sound, um, and have been well thought out and provide our candidates an opportunity to see best practice. So it really is about engaging them in experiences and focused critical reflection so they can increase their knowledge, develop skills, clarify values, and develop the capacity to contribute to diverse communities. It's about developing adaptive expertise, which means that they are able to take their knowledge and apply it to novel situations. Um, in this particular principle, when we did the literature review, we added partnership and partnership because we, we recognize that we cannot provide clinically rich practice-based um, approaches without a PK-12 or community partner, their input and their engagement. So that was one of the additional indicators. And again, you'll learn more when we get the brief on um, practice-based approach. Whew. Lots of stuff. So the next item is on intersectional content. And this is where it all comes together. It is where we ensure that before program completion, our candidates demonstrate mastery of content related to learners, learning, subject matter, pedagogical knowledge, assessment, and importantly, and we, we can't forget this, engagement with families and communities. Such knowledge is dynamic, it's constructed and overlapping. The indicators for uh, this particular principle include coherence, meaning that there is systemic curriculum mapping that ensures horizontal, horizontal, horizontal vertical, subject area, and interdisciplinary coherence. So that it needs to be looked at across the whole span of the program. Standards aligned, content knowledge, um, pedagogical content, curriculum literacy. And, and what we mean by curriculum literacy is that they have the capacity or candidates have the capacity to assess and design high quality instructional materials and positive learning environments. And finally, that we cultivate a critical orientation. And what that means is that we've cultivated an equity lens in candidates as critical and conscious consumers of educational research and resources. And it's that knowledge for teaching. So lot, a lot of information in a short amount of time. And this is what I would kind of say at this point. What I would say at this point is maybe, 
maybe not, but maybe as I was talking through all of these items, you were looking at the same, well, yeah, of course, that makes sense. Absolutely, definitely. Um, and I would say to you that all of these things are really easy to talk about, but they're harder to enact. And so part of, part of the framework and part of what we, we, we want to happen with this framework is one that we, we look at it, we immerse ourselves in it, we, we develop a deep understanding of it, but at the same time that we apply a critical lens to the extent to which we are living the spirit of this framework such that our teacher candidates are entering the profession um, with the knowledge, skills, and dispositions that are necessary to make sure that all PK-12 learners, and most specifically those learners that have been historically marginalized and possibly disenfranchised, that they are meeting with success and are thriving in their environment. So I am going to go to the next slide, which is questions. But before I do, I wanna take a look at the, the chat uh, real quick and kind of take a look at some of the things that have been said here. So beautiful. One of the things that was mentioned was strong aligned clinical experience. Absolutely. That goes into our practice-based approach. This mechanism inherent to listen to student experience, again, absolutely essential. If we have an ethic of care and we have a people first kind of um, uh, value, we know that our students and, and their experiences and what they bring, their funds of knowledge are really important. Um, authentic preparation experiences, absolutely. We don't want them to enter the classroom and be surprised or taken aback by something that they didn't think that would happen or something that they didn't expect. And there's all kinds of things that we're able to, um, to do, all kinds of activities, and uh, practices that we can do that can allow us uh, to engage in that. So those are some of the things that came up. Thank you all so much for sharing that information. I'm going to go ahead and stop and kind of open it up in case anybody has any questions or comments that you would like to share. And I think I'm gonna stop sharing, Kim, because that way we can, we can get everybody's faces and we can kind of go from there. Sounds great. Thank you so much, Patty. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, if you do have questions, you can use that Q&A feature in Zoom. Um, and we'll give everyone a moment to think about all the, the content they just learned and any questions that might be coming up for them. Um, as you're thinking, um, Patty did mention a resource we have, and that is in our resource portal, um, and that link was shared in the chat, so you can make sure to check out that resource and any other resources that we have in our resource portal. Not seeing any questions as of yet, Patty. Um, We'll, we'll wait a little bit more. I know this was an overview, so harder to get questions in an overview. Once I think we dive into each of those principles, I'm sure we'll we'll get more questions as the series continues. Um, Patty, anything else you wanna add before we transition to closing out? Um, no, the only thing that I wanna add is, I'm sure you're hearing my dogs bark. <laughs> And uh, I apologize for that, but what I want to say is I'm going to mute myself so that I don't have to hear it anymore. How's that? Kim, I'm going to let you take it from here. And there we go. I'm on mute, Patty. We're just having a full Zoom day. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much for your time, for your knowledge, for sharing your wisdom with us. And we are just so thrilled for this series to continue on um, this coming year. Um, thank you. So as I mentioned, um, we do have a resource portal. It will look like this. If you can see my screen, you can go on there. The link is in the chat. We would love for you to check out all of our resources, including the one Patty mentioned um, in her presentation today. In addition, um, Patty shared, we want to hear you about what you're doing on ours, on your social platforms. So whether that's LinkedIn, whether that in, is Instagram, whether that's Twitter, um, please use the hashtag branch ed framework. And we'll continue to use that over the series to hear what you're doing um, and to inform our last um, 
webinar of this series um, so we can learn what's happening in the field and learn from all of the things you're doing around our branch ed framework. And lastly, we are thrilled to have you join our next webinar series. Um, it is on October 5th um, at 12 Central Time, 1 Eastern Time. So same, same place, same time. Um, and this will dive into our community of learners principle. And so we are thrilled to have you join us. You can use the QR code um, on the page to register. And with that, we would love to hear about your experiences today. In a moment, you're going to get a brief poll. Um, if you can just answer that brief poll um, and share your experiences with us today. Thank you so much for, for coming with us for our webinar, our first of the series. And we look forward to continuing this conversation um, in the next series, in the next webinar on October 5th. Have a great day. Thank you so much, Patty.